What's up, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. It's time for a recap of what went down on the season finale of Teen Mom OG. Cheyenne in LA announced that she's going to have a helicopter for her gender reveal party. And then she asked when gender reveals became so big, like, why can't we just find out at the doctor's office, at least, you, you know, as if the doctor forced her to put a deposit down on a helicopter to announce, you know, the news that she's having a, a boy or a girl or whatever. By the way, you guys, didn't one of California's biggest wildfires start, uh, you know, over a gender reveal or something like that? Those like big uh, explosion thingies, like firework type things that people use. And then I know of at least two aerial gender reveals turning into deadly plane crashes as well. I really don't understand why people are so damn extra over something so trivial, whether you have a boy or you have a girl, you're lucky you're blessed hopefully your baby is healthy like who cares you know to this extent now i'm um, moving right along it's been one 0.5 months since Bentley gave Ryan his therapist's number and they still haven't had a joint therapy session. And then in Michigan, Caitlin announces her pregnancy to Tyler and they decide to order a shirt in order to announce it to their families as well. And then in Indiana, Amber FaceTimes her therapist to talk about Leah being fed up with her and she blames her deadbeatness on her childhood. But listen, when you willingly bring another child into things as well, who's going through the same things as your first child, can you really continue to blame things on your childhood at this point? Like you are the childhood that you're complaining about for two other people. And so I think it's time to start looking forward and stop looking backward on these sorts of things. Like I get that, like, you know, apparently everything um, has its roots in childhood, but like, at what point do you tell people, you know, help people with like their steps to move forward rather than constantly harping on the past and using it to excuse Excuse all of their present decisions. I, I get really annoyed. But then again, I am not a medical professional, so who knows? On his half of the scene, Gary explains Leah's dynamic with Amber to his mother, and his mother says that Leah has a right to her feelings, and she reminds Gary of the times that Leah cried waiting by the door for Amber to show up because Amber had promised to show up to, you know, spend time with her and see her, and, you know, she would just not show up. And, like, that really broke my heart. I've never seen scenes of Leah like that. Um, but I have seen scenes of Jace like that. And um, that's what I really kind of flash back to when I heard that. Gary said that he's tired of Amber telling Leah that she's going to understand things when she's older. And he wants her to just simply apologize. You know, he's like, listen, I don't think she understands just how powerful a simple apology can be without looking to make excuses and like, you know, claiming that everything is going to like click and come together in the future. So in LA again, Cheyenne finds out that she's having a boy. She's so lucky to have one of each. Then down South in Tennessee, Ryan, the Unabomber and Mackenzie talk about him finally being ready to to go to therapy with Bentley. Ryan says he, that he doesn't like talking about himself, which I guess is true. He very much prefers talking about his quote unquote trigger, Macy. And uh, Mackenzie spills the tea that the two of them have actually gone to a therapist for their relationship. And then I wondered whether it was after the first or the second Tinder affair that Ryan had had. So uh, Ryan then, you know, comes back and he talks about how he enjoyed the conversation with the therapist and was looking forward to the next one. He doesn't know how many more sessions he's got to go and until he can do it alongside Bentley. And oh my God, y'all, this man is still filthy. I wonder what he smells like. Can you guys take a guess? Now in Indiana, Amber has a Zoom call with a lady from an organization that's supposed to help mothers reconnect with their children. This reminded me of Tamara from the Real Housewives of Orange County, you know, doing that sort of thing. It's like a strange mother's or something, something, something like that. So um, it's amazing. You can have all the resources in the world, but if you refuse to like take the advice that all of these professional people are giving you, you know, and put them into practice and actually spend time with your children, then you're kind of just wasting everybody's time at the end of the day. And we all know that that is how Amber is. She doesn't want to leave her house to go spend time with any of these damn kids. You know, it's all just for show in my opinion, of course. So in LA, Cheyenne finds out that her son Ace tested negative for VLCAD and she feels guilty about the idea of celebrating that because, you know, her daughter Ryder has it and she'll always have it for the rest of her life and she doesn't want to make her feel any different. I thought that that was a really 
beautiful, like complicated um, sentiment that she had, you know, it was like, oh my God, that really is such a complex situation to be in. In Tennessee, again, Bentley tells Macy that his therapist told him that Ryan called and did a phone session. She then talks to Taylor about it and they are both cautiously optimistic about him, you know, continuing to do it. And so Taylor calls Ryan a dark cloud and says that Ryan needs to be drug tested before they go together for a session before because he never looks sober. To me, it kind of seemed as though he was getting into cold territory there because it appeared as though Macy was just happy that Ryan called in to do the sessions and he wanted him to get to do a session with Bentley and everything, you know, kind of before they worried about all of the other stuff. It was Macy that brought up the drug testing. So of course she understands the importance of it, but I feel as though at that like kind of like moment and situation, she didn't want to throw it ahead of Ryan in order to like, you know, maybe scare him out of continuing and getting to the joint therapy sessions with Bentley. I get that it's really complicated. Like when do you bring back up the whole drug testing thing? But, you know, maybe because the therapist is, you know, a licensed professional, you know, Ryan spending time around Bentley or doing phone sessions, like three ways with Bentley, like I, I could see, you know, why maybe she wouldn't be too worried about it at that point and maybe want to kick that can a little bit later down the road when they get to it. You know what I mean? Down in Indiana again, Amber went to hang out with Leah and strategically brought her quote unquote son, James, along knowing that MTV would not be able to film Leah dragging her again for my finale special. You know, um, so she later just recounted the visit with her producer and pretended to cry about Leah not being ready to spend more time with her again. Her producer, by the way, you guys, seems to imply that Amber should take a cue from her mom and kick Leah out of her life or something. Like her producer was like, oh, so like, you know how you said that in like this one story that like your mom kicked you out of the house at 15 and you felt that that really like shaped your like life and relationship with her. I'm like, sis, town, village send, whatever the hell your name is, Leah is like 12 years old. Like, what do you mean kick her? Like, and second of all, she doesn't even live in Amber's house. So she doesn't like, what? I, I thought that that was such a strange comment and I really did not like it. And I did not get where she was going with it. And if she was going where I thought she was going with it, then she is a mess too, just like Amber. I guess it is rubbing off. So, um, you know, Amber then tells a story about her dad and like how like she was at his house once and like, I, I don't know what happened. Police were called at some point. And then she told the police that she wanted to go because he's dying and he's not sober and they're like wouldn't that make you want to stay more to this child who's obviously traumatized by their parent being you know inebriated allegedly every day that they are around her very very bizarre story i felt bad for her in that story but listen she tried to squeeze out tears for these stories and for her daughter but as usual they never came out i did see like maybe one tear but it was barely there it wasn't a very strong stream of water it's kind of like you know when you like close a tap and you think you close it all the way and you get a couple of drips you know not the full stream it was kind of that so um you know in michigan y'all caitlin announces her second miscarriage which is very unfortunate but she um thankfully seems to be handling it much better than she did the first time she really has come quite a long way and then we then see you know nova she's got like this little statue thing that Caitlin and Tyler had made after their first miscarriage. And Nope is the one explaining, you know, that the baby, you know, had been miscarried or something like, sh and, you know, I was like, okay, she seemed to understand, you know, that this happened. And I thought that that was nice. And I'm really proud to see how well she has kept herself together this entire season. She has looked so beautiful, well put together. Her hair was always done, makeup done, nails done. She just looked so much happier and healthier. Her horse was brushed a couple of times that I saw it too. You know, like she was really like, um, you know, vibrant again. And that just made me so freaking happy for her. And as you all know, she and Tyler did manage to get pregnant again. And she is still currently pregnant with what is going to be, there's Carly, there's Nova, um, there's Veda at fourth girl, y'all, fourth girl, but third that they're, you know, going to be raising um, by themselves. Anyway, you guys, that does it. A recap of the Teen Mom OG finale episode. I got to say this season was so dry and I think it's getting shorter and shorter because usually their seasons are maybe like 16 episodes, like it's never ending, but this one went by really, really quickly. It was only like 12 episodes. And I also have to complain, listen, Macy witnessed a whole shooting, you know, and we never got more than like a little afterthought conversation about it. Like what? You know what I mean? Like this uh, beating down the the Bentley Ryan storyline to death every single week. And she goes through something so huge and amazing that like, 
people rarely, you know, go through in life that she could have like really opened up, but like, you know what I mean? Like peeled the lid back on and we got like no content about that. That was really, really disappointing to me. But anyway, y'all, um, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm also really curious, y'all, where does Cheyenne's money come from? Because listen, I know she's on Team Omoji, but she hasn't been on as long as the other girls to be as flashy as she is. I know she did Are You The One as well, but that was like 10 years ago or six, seven years ago. And she lives in LA, which is a very high cost of living city versus the other girls. And she's just so flashy with it with the Rolexes, the diamond tennis bracelets and stuff like that. I'm really, really the big helicopter for the gender reveal party, all the other big parties that she's having. That girl's got a strong coin and I'm on the loose to figure out where it came from. I don't know. Maybe it's Instagram ads. I don't know. Anyway, you guys, that does it. Recap of the season finale of Teen Mom OG. But as usual, I'm more looking forward to hearing what you have to say about everything. So please make sure to let me know all of your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below and we'll chat. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.